On the 23rd of March, 1940, in Berlin, the Ministry of Justice of the Third Reich received orders from Reichsfuhrer Heinrich Himmler to begin the creation of a new military unit, a veritable dirty dozen that would take the form of a small poacher's unit and quickly germinate into a full-sized division led by a violent alcoholic and consisting of psychopaths and murderers. It would become one of the most notorious and depraved mechanisms within the Nazi war machine. Despised by high command and hated by their fellow military peers, the 36th Waffen Grenadier Division, or the Sturmbrigade Dörlewanger, would leave a trail of blood and carnage across Eastern Europe, and its members would largely escape justice after the war. The division began, as all awful things do, as something very small. Originally called the Oranienburg Poachers Unit, it was comprised of 80 men who had been arrested for the crime of poaching. Originally the unit's task would be to track and hunt down local partisans, groups of civilian and military personnel within the conquered territories that had begun waging a guerrilla war against the German occupation. Himmler sold the idea of forming the unit to Hitler through a very romanticized lens, viewing the men not as criminals, but as the ideal wild German man, professional hunters who had forsaken the rule of law in favor of a life outside of the modern world, living only for the thrill of the chase and the hunt. Men of strong constitution and bravery, who could track their prey over the most rugged terrain, knowing that ever caught they risked the Reich's retribution. And if these men could catch dangerous game like boar or stag, then surely they could hunt people, particularly partisans or escaped prisoners from one of the Reich's many labor camps. Hitler liked the romanticized image that he was being painted and gave Himmler's idea his blessing. Besides, the armed forces were preparing for the invasion of France and the Reich would need fresh recruits for its campaign in the West. Less reputable men could oversee the territories in Poland. So Himmler made his call to the Ministry of Justice and they in turn sent out the orders through the network of prisons and concentration camps. By June of 1940, 80 men were standing in the Oranienburg military barracks. The man chosen to lead this band of reprobates was one Dr. Oskar Paul Derlewanger. For such a task, he was considered to be the ideal candidate for the job based on his own outstanding military record. Born on the 26th of September, 1895, to a small merchant family in Swabia, he enjoyed a simple and happy childhood. During the start of the Great War, at the age of 18, he was assigned to the 123rd Grenadier Regiment and placed in the army vanguard into Belgium that was destined for northern France. It's likely here that he witnessed the atrocities perpetrated against Belgian civilians, with an estimate of six to 7,000 being murdered by the Kaiser's men between the months of August to November of 1914. Dolevanger would throw himself into the worst of the hellfire, repeatedly volunteering for the harshest assignments. He would be wounded a total of six times during the conflict and decorated for his bravery, obtaining the rank of lieutenant. After recovering from a near fatal knife wound, he once again volunteered this time for the Eastern Front. Here he would be deployed against the now crumbling Russian Empire Yet with Germany's defeat one year later, Derlewanger was ordered by the new Weimar government to march his troops to Romania for internment. Breaking precedent, he refused the order and instead led 600 men back to the Fatherland, where he joined the Freikorps, a paramilitary unit made up of disaffected veterans who despised the new government, but not as much as they hated communists and socialists. Under the command of General Sprosser, he fought in Saxony with revolutionary groups, communist militants, and put down workers' strikes in his native Württemberg. During this time, he enrolled and graduated from the University of Frankfurt and completed his doctorate in political science. In 1923, he joined the local branch of the Nazi party and was seen as the ideal stormtrooper for the young political group. Yet his military zeal hid a darker character. A hardcore alcoholic, degenerate, and sexual sadist, Dolevanger was periodically in trouble with the law repeatedly being arrested for public intoxication and fighting with local police. He became an embarrassment to the party after being caught embezzling funds from his employers for the local branch of the SA. In 1934, under the iron rule of the Third Reich, Derlewanger was arrested and convicted of the rape of a 14-year-old girl of the Red Cross. Labelled a degenerate, he was imprisoned in Velsheim concentration camp and stripped of his military honours, his doctorate and party membership. 
His life should have ended there, or at the bottom of a bottle. Yet he would be saved by an old army comrade, Gottlob Berger. Berger was a powerful senior member of Himmler's SS, who was instrumental in the organization's growth and recruitment. Berger easily had Derlewanger's charges overturned and reinstated all his honors. Securing him a position in the Condor Legion, Derlewanger would put his skills to work, serving in the armies of Spanish dictator Francisco Franco in the Spanish Civil War, fighting from 1936 to 39. Upon returning to Berlin, he received the rank of Oberstrumführer, Lieutenant, and placed in charge of the newly created Oranienburg Poachers Unit. Now under his command, the 80 men were given two months of intensive training, of which only 50 passed the health requirements. 20 more poachers were brought in, along with four SS officers with reputations as questionable as Derlewanger's, now assembled, the unit of criminals and their alcoholic of a commander, set off for the city of Lublin in occupied Poland, right on the border with the Soviet Union. Arriving in September of 1940, they were placed under the command of the SS Totenkopfverband, the dreaded organization in charge of the Reich's network of concentration camps. The unit became the terror of the streets of Lublin, particularly at the labor camp in the Jewish ghetto. Violence became part of everyday life, raiding homes, beating the occupants, and looting their belongings. In a number of cases, the victims were turned out into the streets to be publicly flogged before being executed. In another case, the unit used their dogs to savage and tear apart their victims, laughing while the beasts tore into soft human flesh. The laborers at the camp fared just as bad. Standing guard, they would watch as the exhausted workers constructed fortifications along the border. Starvation and hunger were no excuse for poor workmanship. Pleas for mercy would fall on deaf ears and be met with the usual cruel response. At the guardhouse, Dolevanger would hold court like some drunken petty king, dividing up the loot from their raids, with the lieutenant taking the lion's share. Sometime prisoners would be brought in for their amusement, who would then be subjected to the unit's signature cruelty. In one instance, a group of Jewish women were taken, stripped naked and whipped bloody. Afterwards, Derlewanger, in an act of sadistic cruelty, injected them with strychnine so he could watch them convulse on the floor for his amusement. The unit's actions did not go unnoticed, however. Local authorities, along with SS police, had become tired of their heavy-handed actions, their looting and public drunkenness being of particular note. They even drew the ire of the dreaded Gestapo, who accused Derlewanger of murder, corruption, and race defilement with his Jewish housekeeper. Party officials found their desks piled high with complaints and demands that the unit be disbanded and its men thrown back into prison. But Derlewanger would appeal to Berger, who would sweep the complaints aside and silence his comrades' critics with demotions or even redeployment. This protection would last throughout the war. In the summer of 41, the unit would be expanded to 300 men, just in time for the titanic Operation Barbarossa. Hitler's dream of a German empire in the east was taking shape as the Wehrmacht steamrolled its way towards Moscow, all but crushing the unprepared Red Army. Now named the Special Commando Derlewanger, Himmler ordered them to begin anti-partisan operations in Belarus and mopping up the remnants of communist forces. In the thick forests and marshlands of Belarus, the battalion would participate in large-scale sweeping operations of areas designated as Totenzonen, or death zones. Once an area had been designated as one of these zones, military and police units would systematically cull the population, destroying villages, deporting the able-bodied for slave labor, and slaughtering those deemed unfit for such work. The aim was to restrict the movements of partisans and deprive them of any aid from the local population. As the units swept through the area, they acted like a noose around a neck, growing tighter with every unit that linked up leaving a trail of death behind them. In one year, the battalion participated in 11 large-scale sweeps. Derlewanger's favored tactic was to herd frightened villagers into barns and then set them ablaze. Those that escaped the flames would be shot, after which the hunters would loot the village, alcohol being their favored prize. Reprisals were also common. After three men were killed in an ambush, 
Berlevanger would avenge them by hunting down the partisans responsible, and then burn down a local village that he believed had aided in the attack, but was little more than an act of spite. To better participate in these operations, the battalion was expanded to a full regiment, but with fresh poachers in short supply, the standard was lowered, with new recruits being thieves, murderers, sexual degenerates, psychopaths, drug addicts, and the criminally insane. Dolevanger was not enthusiastic about these new recruits, but he used them nonetheless. In May of 1943, just north of Minsk, the Black Hunters participated in Operation Cottbus, the largest sweep so far. Operating in tandem with SS commandos and police units, they waged the Reich's War of Annihilation. Dolevanger and his men would slaughter, pillage and rape their way across the country, showing no mercy. Civilians would be forced to dig their own graves before being shot. In some cases, the corpses were burned, and anyone unfortunate to have survived would be thrown onto the flames. After a month, the regiment had participated in the murder of over 20,000 people, and had lost only 59 men. The overwhelming majority of these casualties had to have been unarmed civilians, instead of well-seasoned partisans. In Berlin, Himmler praised the regiment's actions, decorating Dolevanger with the German cross in gold, and gave special commendation for his use of mine detectors in saving German lives. These mine detectors were civilians, who were forced at gunpoint to march across active minefields. In total, the Black Hunters had burned over several dozen villages, and personally murdered more than 30,000 civilians during their time in occupied Belarus. However, by 1944, the Reich's war machine had begun to break down. The USSR, once on the verge of collapse, had performed a stunning reversal and was now on an aggressive offensive. On the 22nd of June, Stalin initiated Operation Bagration, unleashing the juggernaut of the Red Army. By August, they had overrun Belarus, all but destroyed German Army Group Center, capturing 300,000 men, and gained footholds in the Baltics and Poland. Dolnavanger's new regiment of psychopaths was overwhelmed by the Russians. Cut down and decimated by professionals, they quickly fell back with the retreating Wehrmacht and secured their positions in Poland. Here the unit was hastily reorganized with additional combat groups becoming a Sturmbrigade, or Assault Brigade, and were ordered to suppress the Warsaw Uprising. Here they would be deployed alongside the equally infamous Kaminsky Brigade. Both groups were given a free hand to run rampant by Himmler, with no regard to civilian life. The Reichsfuhrer wanted the city and its people wiped from the face of the earth. Fighting in the streets was brutal, with the Poles inflicting heavy casualties on the Germans, making them pay for every step they gained. Matthias Schenk, a Belgian serving in the Wehrmacht, describes Dolevanger's troops. They had drunk a lot and weren't sober. They immediately attacked the Polish positions. They charged the houses yelling, Hurrah! Just in front of the houses, they fell under Polish fire. Yet despite these costly charges, the Sturmbrigade had unleashed its most sadistic cruelty on Warsaw, smashing into churches to find cowering civilians who were shot on sight. A priest was beaten with a crucifix, the altar defiled, while the nuns were subjected to the unit's vile predations. Three Red Cross hospitals were stormed, the patients were burned alive in their beds, while the doctors and their nurses were hanged. Some of the men drank and sang folk songs, as the bodies swung in the smoke-filled breeze. In another case, the door to a daycare was blown open. Five hundred small children stood, their hands in the air. It was Dr. Dolevanger who gave the order, telling his men to use their rifle butts and bayonets so as to save their ammunition. The room was slick with blood and pulp when they left. This slaughter contributed to what became known as the Vola Massacre, with upwards of 40,000 civilians being murdered in mere days. For this act of cruelty, Dolevanger was awarded the Knight's Cross of the Iron Cross by General Reinfarth and promoted to SS Oberfuhrer. As the army secured the smoldering ruins of the city, Dolevanger and his men would head south, participating in the suppression of the Slovakian uprising. In February of 45, the brigade was expanded for one last time, becoming an SS Grenadier Division, its members swelling with an influx of deserters and former condemned men. But the division's days, like the Reich's, were numbered. Deployed against Soviet forces in Brandenburg, Dolevanger, who always led his men from the front, 
was shot in the chest and was removed to the rear for medical treatment. It would be his twelfth and final injury. As Germany fell apart, so did the division, with desertions occurring en masse. In one case, the men hanged their NCO and surrendered to the Americans. Even Oscar Dörlewanger, realizing defeat was imminent, abandoned his uniform for civilian clothes and disappeared into the chaos. The 36th Grenadier Division of the SS was last sighted fighting in the Halbe pocket, not far from Berlin. Here the Black Hunters, the most reviled unit within the SS Empire, was finally swallowed up by the wrath of the Red Army. Only a handful of men escaped the Soviet offensive, being able to surrender to the Americans in the West. The victorious allies carved up Germany into occupation zones and trials were held. Men like Gottlob Berger, once powerful and feared, were now prisoners. When questioned about Derlewanger and his unit, Berger downplayed its excesses. His only criticism of his old friend was, he had one big mistake, that he didn't know when to stop drinking. Berger would be found guilty of war crimes and sentenced to 25 years at Landsberg prison, but was released after six years in 1951. He would die of natural causes in 1975. Some believed that Derlewanger was still alive, with members of his unit travelling to Egypt to find him, believing that the old butcher was living in Cairo. Even Berger believed that his old war comrade was hiding in Latin America. In truth, they need not have travelled very far. Living in the French occupation zone, under an assumed name, Derlewanger remained in hiding until he was recognised by a former camp inmate. Arrested by French authorities on June 1, 1945, he was taken to Althausen prison. Here, the exact details of what transpired that night still remain a mystery. But one story goes that the Polish guards who had watched over the prisoners recognised the Butcher of Warsaw and decided on their own justice. The Poles entered his cell late one night and when they left, Oscar Derlewanger was dead. The following morning, an autopsy declared that he had died from his war injuries. His remains were quickly thrown into an unmarked grave, disposed of like trash. Though vengeance had cheated the hangman's justice, it was here that Oscar Paul Derlewanger, the mad dog of the East, the alcoholic, the butcher, the monster of Belarus, met a brutal and savage, yet well-deserved and well-earned end. While Derlewanger had met his end at the hands of his former prey, the same could not be said of the remaining black hunters. Of the division's 4,000 men, less than 700 had survived the war. With the conflict over, they would disappear back into civilian life, hoping to escape the shadows of their dark past in the East. And there they would remain. There would be no trial, no justice. The men would simply fade into the sidelines of this new Germany, as it struggled to pick up the pieces and come to terms with the sea of atrocities that the Reich had perpetrated. Their own crimes sinking into the deep black abyss, and with the passing of time, the men of the Derlewanger Brigade, the worst of the worst, would be confined to the pages of history. <laughs>